Bienvenidos a la Facultad de Ciencias de la Documentación y a esta primera conferencia del seminario del profesor Moul, integrado dentro de las actividades de la Cátedra Hispano-Británica Reina Victoria Eugenia, que anualmente celebra y coordina junto con la Universidad Complutense de Madrid. En esta ocasión le ha correspondido a la Facultad de Ciencias de la Documentación ser la sede de este seminario de la Cátedra Hispano-Británica y tenemos la suerte de contar con un magnífico profesor e investigador de la Universidad de Edimburgo, sobre el cual ahora tratará más extensamente la profesora Esther Burgos Bordonau sobre su currículum. Yo ahora me voy a limitar a dar algunas instrucciones o explicaciones al alumnado, a los inscritos. Eh, supuestamente hay 60 inscritos en el seminario. Creo que todos habéis recibido correos los últimos días. Hay alumnos de grado, alumnos de posgrado y alumnos de doctorado inscritos al seminario. A las... Y el seminario se divide cada semana, cada tres veces que viene, va a venir ahora en diciembre, luego vendrá en febrero y después vendrá en abril. Esos seminarios están formados por tres actividades distintas. La primera es una conferencia donde el profesor Moul eh, explica, tanto alumnos de grado, máster y doctorado, cuál es el objetivo general de, de, el, de las clases durante esa semana. Los dos días siguientes, ese tema general se desarrolla para alumnos de máster y de doctorado. Y ya, por último, el, el, el tercer día, cuarto día, dependiendo de si hay puente o no, como ha ocurrido en esta semana, entonces lo que nos encontramos es ya un seminario eh, limitado para alumnos de doctorado. La conferencia y las clases están abiertas a alumnos de grado, de máster y de doctorado. El último seminario es solamente para alumnos de doctorado. La profesora Esther Burgos ha traído un listado de inscritos en el seminario, que ahora os vamos a pasar para que cada uno de vosotros firméis, porque tenemos que tener un seguimiento de la asistencia, y para que añadáis a vuestro nombre vuestra titulación. Si os habéis inscrito como alumnos de grado, os habéis inscrito como alumnos de máster o como alumnos de doctorado. Y en función de eso podremos hacer mucho mejor el seguimiento de cada uno de vosotros. Como sabéis, también hay una beca de mil libras para realizar una estancia de investigación en la Universidad de Edimburgo. Eh, no es una beca, ya lo digo aquí, pero creo que ya lo dije por el correo, para alumnos de grado, porque es un tema de investigación. Será el profesor Moul y el comité organizador, si así lo precisara, quien decidirá eh, la persona que va a recibir esa beca y que realizará esa investigación durante un tiempo determinado en la Universidad de Edimburgo bajo la dirección del profesor Mou. Es decir, tiene que haber una cierta relación entre lo que quiere investigar el alumno o alumna que reciba la beca y el profesor Mou. Desde luego, para la Facultad de Ciencia de la Documentación, pues es un honor tener aquí al profesor Mou y eh, ya solamente por seguir con el cronograma, eh, recordaros que la segunda estancia, la conferencia, será en la Facultad de Filología. Hay muchos alumnos de Filología Inglesa que se han inscrito en este seminario. Y la tercera instancia, la conferencia inaugural de esa estancia, va a ser en la Facultad de Comercio y Turismo, que se encuentra muy cerca de aquí, en la avenida Islas Filipinas. Así que, sin más, doy la palabra a la profesora Esther Burgos para que presente al conferenciante y ya... Eh, a continuación, pues tomará él la palabra y, como ya creo que también hemos indicado, todas las clases eh, serán en inglés. Muchas gracias. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, let's start speaking in English, as this is going to be a lecture in English, and Thomas will follow me much better. Um, as you all know, and Dean has explained, uh, today we are starting this seminar with this first, first lecture entitled books in the world of things. Then he will give another group of classes in this faculty, and finally the doctoral seminar. I will try to explain very briefly, because it's his turn, not mine, uh, his curriculum, which is very wide and very interesting, and also his last publications. Uh, Dr. Mole studied at the university in Bristol, and he has been working there for a long time, And also, um, he has been working in other faculties and universities 
along uh, the UK. Um, I should outstand that he also obtained a scholarship in McGill University in Montreal, Canada, where he was working as a key member of the Multigraph Collective that wrote Interacting with Print, that I will mention later. Um, since 2014, he's been working in the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, where he's also the director of the Center for the History of the Book. There, he's teaching book history and English literature, mainly. Um, <clears throat> his curriculum, as I said before, it's very long and very wide, and I don't want to take more time from his lecture, but I would like to mention, or at least uh, outstand, some of his main publications. Um, today, he brought us, he brought me, his last book, which is The Secret Life of Books, recently published in this 2019, uh, but uh, he has a long um, list of books with, which I would like to mention. The last one, as I told you, is The Secret Life of Books, a beautiful one, a beautiful also um, result of the book. And uh, previously, as uh, I think um, most of you have read in the inscription, he's a specialist in Victorian period and in Lord Byron, so he has written a lot about these topics. In fact, his uh, previous book was What the Victorians Made of Romanticism, Material Artifacts, Cultural Practices and Reception History, printed in 2017 in Princeton. Before that, he had also published Interacting with Print, Elements of Reading in an Era of Print Saturation. Before that, he also published the Broadview Introduction to Book History and the Broadview Reader in Book History. Before that, in 2012, he published Romanticism and Celebrity Culture, 1750-1850, and Byron's Romantic Celebrity, Industrial Cultural Culture and the Hermeneutic of Intimacy. He has a long list of books which I'm not going to um, read, but of course, uh, he's an excellent um, guest in this faculty, he's an excellent guest in this university, and we are very, very proud of having here uh, Dr. Moll today. Uh, we are sure, the dean, the rest of the members of the staff, and me personally, that it's going to be very interesting, not only this lecture of today, but also the rest of the classes that he's going to give to our students. And uh, I don't want to take more time, so I just have to say that, um, he, probably, I, I asked this to him before when we were coming. Uh, Dr. Mould cannot speak Spanish, but hopefully maybe in his next trip he might be able to tell us something more in Spanish, but I will be here to help him anyway. Um, however, this lecture will be in English and all the classes, as we said before. And uh, just I want to say again, the same as the Dean said before, thank you for, for being here today with us, for choosing this faculty, because when we when we started this competitive um, um, career of who is going to obtain the chair, the Victoria Eugenia chair, uh, the dean was very, um, was very quick and very fast, and he uh, quickly selected this profile of professor, and we were so lucky that he accepted our invitation. So we are very proud of having here Mr. Thomas Moll today with us, and in my name and in the name of the Dean and the rest of the members of the staff, thank you for accepting, thank you for being here today, and welcome, and you have the floor to start your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, those generous words of welcome. Uh, it's a great honor and a pleasure to take up this chair uh, at, the, uh, at Complutense University. And uh, I look forward to this and to my two subsequent visits and the classes that I will give and to meeting uh, many students and colleagues uh, here, both in the faculty and in the libraries, um, and to getting to know you better. I'm sorry that I can't speak to you today in Spanish. Uh, you must blame the terrible provinciality of English education for that, um, but uh, I hope that you will be able to understand me okay. <coughs> Caravaggio made several attempts to depict St. Jerome, 
But as far as I'm concerned, the most interesting is the one he painted in Rome around 1605, which you see here. Jerome had translated the Bible into Latin, and the Catholic Church officially endorsed his version at the Council of Trent around 50 years before Caravaggio painted this work. The saint was a popular subject for artists. He was usually painted with his red cardinal's hat and his emblem, the tame lion, sitting like a shaggy dog alongside Jerome as he worked surrounded by books in his study. In fact, Jerome was never a cardinal. The rank didn't exist until centuries after his death, and I don't suppose he really had a tame lion either. In any case, Caravaggio leaves out the hat and the lion entirely and includes just three massive books on Jerome's simple, sturdy table, plunging the rest of the scene into the kind of deep shadow that was one of his trademarks. Jerome is a study in physical decay. His body is so frail that it almost disappears from the painting altogether. His lower half, the parts associated with sex and excretion, vanishes behind a shapeless red drapery, the only remains of his cardinal's robe. Two glints of white paint stand out. The shine of Jerome's bald head, which reflects an impossible light, and the white quill pen, whose feathers have all been stripped off, clasped in the saint's frail hand. Almost all that's left of Jerome is a head to think and a pen to write. And even these won't last long, the painting seems to say. The saint's bony head and drapery to the right are balanced in the composition by the rumpled white tablecloth to the left and the skull on his desk. They are a reminder of what Jerome himself will soon become. The head full of intelligence and inspiration will soon enough become a skull emptied of its consciousness and wrapped in a winding sheet. In this painting, the body perishes, but the book survives. Jerome's books are far more substantial and durable than he is. Huge folios containing hundreds of pages, they dominate the centre of the composition. While the saint is emaciated, the books in their leather bindings are sleek and solid. As well as being a meditation on mortality, this painting is a celebration of the book, and in particular the Codex. We know that Christians were early adopters of the Codex format, which gained ground over the first five centuries CE. But the historical Jerome, who lived from 347 to 420 CE, finishing his translation in 384, probably worked with scrolls as much as with codices. The books that weigh down Jerome's table in Caravaggio's painting are therefore something of an anachronism. Caravaggio places the codex in the middle of the painting as a reminder that books allow our words to outlive us. The materiality of Jerome's books is reassuring. You can almost hear the dull thud they made as he put them down on the desk, almost feel the strain in the saint's wasted arms as he lifts them and moves them. While the saint is headed towards the grave, the books are here to stay. Their heft is a metaphor for their importance. These are weighty books in two senses, both heavy and profound. But, for all the massive sturdiness of the books on Jerome's desk, they won't last forever. One of them is already starting to decay. The leather binding of the closed book on the left is just beginning to peel away from the spine. Now, the closed book might symbolise the 40 versions of the Bible that Jerome is superseding with his new translation. And in that case, the shabby binding could be an image of their obsolescence. But there's really little difference between the three books in the painting. The book in which Jerome is apparently writing doesn't look any more splendid or solid than the others. At the same time as it sets the durability of the book against the fragility of the body then, this painting also includes a reminder that even divinely inspired texts have to circulate in books that are physical objects, subject to wear and tear 
and prone to decay. Like many painters, Caravaggio put himself through an apprenticeship of still lives. Many of his earlier paintings depict assemblages of flowers and fruits, including some in various stages of wilting and rotting. A skull, the traditional memento mori, is also a standard part of the still life paraphernalia. These so-called vanitas paintings display both the abundance of God's creation and the transience of all earthly things. Everything is tending towards its own dissolution. Caravaggio brings the same sensibility to some of his depictions of human bodies, which are scrutinised for evidence of their mortality. Jerome's body here is evidently painfully mortal. He looks like he hasn't got long left in this world and the skull reinforces the impression. But in this picture, Caravaggio turns the same searching gaze onto the book. On one hand, Jerome's books are robust, massive, powerful. This painting offers a glimpse into the primal scene of a book that would change the world, becoming a key text for Christians for centuries to come. And yet, Caravaggio cannot help but depict the books as subject to the common lot of objects as well as of men. They too are part of the fallen world, and they too are subject to the ravages of time. Caravaggio was at the height of his powers in his mid-thirties when he painted this version of St. Jerome. He was a successful artist with wealthy patrons, including the powerful Cardinal Scipione, Scipione Borghese, who might have commissioned this painting, which now hangs in the Galleria Borghese in Rome. But Caravaggio's wild life would soon catch up with him. Not long after he finished this picture, he killed a man in a brawl in a tavern over a gambling debt, and was forced to flee Rome. We don't know whether he took any books with him when he left, but it seems unlikely he had room for the large and heavy folios from the painting of St. Jerome in his luggage. It's perfectly possible that they still exist in a library somewhere, but it's more likely that, like most of the books ever produced, they've been lost to history. All that's left of them is their depiction on Caravaggio's canvas. There, Caravaggio seems to insist that whatever else they are, ark of God's word, source of divine light, key to salvation, they are also things. Sometimes the moment when you can see a book most clearly as an object is the moment when it stops working as it's supposed to. When I was an undergraduate trying to finish George Eliot's novel Middlemarch for class the following day, I turned a page partway through the book to discover that I'd gone back in time. I was rereading sentences that I distinctly remembered reading earlier that morning. No longer absorbed in the story, I looked more closely at another aspect of the book, its page numbers, and discovered that instead of page 140 being followed by page 141, it was actually followed by a second copy of page 109. As I flipped through a few more pages, it became clear that a whole chunk of text had been duplicated and a corresponding chunk was missing. The time of the story was out of joint, its characters stranded in limbo, compelled to repeat their actions of 30 pages earlier. I wasn't going to be able to read the novel in time for class unless I found another copy. These days, of course, I could simply have gone online to find the text, but back then I had to go out to a library or bookshop to find a replacement. As a vehicle for delivering the text of Middlemarch, my book had broken down. But in that moment, it was also revealed to me in a new light. I was no longer able to ignore the physical form of the book, to treat it as just a window onto the words. Instead, the book reappeared as a thing. I thought, really for the first time, about how it had been made in a factory by machines. I noticed that it was the product of technologies and processes about which I knew very little. I became aware that fallible individuals had manufactured it. I realised the book had been assembled from different parts, and that in this case some of those parts had got mixed up. Quite suddenly then, I perceived the book in my hands as an object in a way that hadn't previously occurred to me. And it was also clear in that moment that this copy of Middlemarch was unlike others that purported to be the same. 
different editions of the same novel and even other copies of the same edition didn't have the same problem as this copy. Although they all seem to offer the same experience, the experience of reading George Eliot's novel, that experience differed according to the particular book the reader encountered the novel in. As a communications technology, my book had crashed. But other books contained bugs and glitches that we put up with quite happily. Misprints or misnumbered pages, and as their lives went on, pages stained, dog-eared, ripped out, or torn, or in other ways damaged. So although I'd read plenty of books, these were things that I'd scarcely given any thought to before. Only when my book broke down did it become impossible to take it for granted. Quite a long time after that, I discovered that this experience in which an object becomes visible as such when it stops working as it's intended to, was one that I apparently shared with the philosopher Martin Heidegger. His example is not a book, but a hammer. When you're using a hammer and everything is going well, you don't stop to think about the hammer. Only You think only about the business of hammering. If you stop to think about the hammer, the chances are you'll hit your own thumb. It's only when the hammer breaks, Heidegger suggests, that the carpenter's relationship to it changes. In that moment, the hammer loses its, uh, what Heidegger's translators call its equipmentality, its status as a tool, its tool being Zeugsein. And it becomes visible then to the carpenter as a thing. And the same is true of books. They tend to disappear when in use. In that moment when we're fully absorbed in a book, we experience a kind of direct access to the author's words, the author's imagined world, even the author's thoughts, that can seem almost mystical in nature. The medium does its job most effectively when it becomes most transparent. We stop noticing the book and become immersed in the world it contains. This is a sort of ecstasy in the distinctive historical sense of going outside of oneself into a kind of swoon or trance or heightened state of consciousness. As we enter the author's world, we lose sight of the book as an object. Marcel Proust, in his essay on reading, provides a wonderful description of this kind of submersion in a book. Proust recounts how, as a child, he retreated in the morning to the dining room where he planned to read in a chair by the fire until lunchtime. But the cook came in to lay the table for lunch and disturbed him. This is how he describes it. She thought she had to say, You're not comfortable like that. What if I brought you a table? And just to answer no thank you, you had to stop short and bring back from afar your voice, which from within your lips was repeating noiselessly, hurriedly, all the words your eyes had read. You had to stop it, make it be heard, and, in order to say properly, no thank you, give it an appearance of ordinary life, the intonation of an answer which it had lost. Proust celebrates the book's ability to transport its reader to another place, as the reader's body is colonised by the author and his voice is no longer his own. This passage is a favourite among readers who celebrate that slightly uncanny pleasure of being absorbed in a story. And perhaps this experience is especially intense for children. I know I sometimes have to say my daughter's name several times in order to bring her out of storyland and back to the real world. But Proust has little to say about the book he's reading. Is it large or small, heavy or light, new or old, thick or thin, colourful or plain, tattered or pristine? His prose, usually so profligate with details, has nothing to say about these matters. The cook whose labours leave her no time for reading that morning, sees things differently. While the young Marcel is lost in the book's contents, the cook responds to it as an object. It must be heavy. Perhaps it's too large for the small boy to handle comfortably. Wouldn't a table make things easier? Her concerns are resolutely practical. It's precisely because she's excluded from reading the book by her class, her gender, and her job, that she can see it as an object. In this sense, she's better attuned to my topic than the young Proust, for whom the book has entirely disappeared in the experience of its reading. 
Now, I enjoy that experience of immersion in a book as much as any reader, but I also think that we might try and take a step back from it in order to allow the book to become the object of our attention in a different way, as it was for the Proust family's cook, as it became for me that day reading Middlemarch. When books stop serving us as tools or interfaces, they also start to come into view as things. My experience of Middlemarch stayed with me for a long time, and it changed the way that I look at books forever. Once I started really to pay attention to books, rather than just looking at the words they contained, I realised how much my books had been marked by how I used them. The wrinkles along the spine of my copy of Middlemarch showed how far I'd read before the book broke down. A poetry anthology fell open at a favourite poem. Cookbooks showed fingerprints on favourite recipes. Cake recipes had acquired cocoa-coloured smudges, while curry recipes were redolent of spices stuck between the pages. Like clothes or shoes that start off as identical copies and mould to their owner's bodies over time, books get worn in. Once I started to pay attention to books as objects, I began to see traces of how those objects had been used or not used. Some books that I really should have read still look suspiciously pristine on my shelf. Books don't just reveal how they've been used by their current owners. They sometimes carry scars from past encounters as well. In his novel Far From the Madding Crowd from 1874, Thomas Hardy describes a family Bible whose pages have been quite worn away in popular passages by unpractised readers in former days, dragging their fingers along under the words as they read. Taking up the Bible reveals the semi-literate state of its earlier readers, as well as the passages that most interested them. To the careful observer, then, the book can be excavated like an archaeological dig, revealing layer upon layer of information about its previous users from the material traces they left behind them. Different people handle their books in different ways and so leave different kinds of traces. And the more I looked at books, the more I learned to recognise these traces. The editor and essayist Anne Fadiman distinguishes between two kinds of book lover, the courtly and the carnal. When I read her description, I remembered two university friends who exemplified the two types. The courtly book lover bought nice editions and did her best to preserve them in pristine condition. She had a little ritual that I've never known anyone else perform. When she got a new paperback, she stood it up on its spine on the table in front of her and then taking a small gathering of the first and last pages between each thumb and forefinger, she eased them down towards the table. Then she took two gatherings nearer the centre and repeated that and so on, fanning the pages out gently as she worked her way towards the midpoint of the volume. In this way, she softened and flexed the spine before she started reading the book. The spine stayed smooth and firm as a result, instead of cracking or creasing, where it had been recklessly bent backwards somewhere midway through the book at a particularly exciting moment in the plot. Her books stood resplendent on her shelves, looking almost as clean and bright as they had in the shop. Needless to say, she never wrote in them. The carnal book lover, on the other hand, could never have brought herself to perform the spine-softening ritual. It would have meant deferring the pleasure of reading the book. She pounced on a new book and devoured it. Dog-eared corners held no fear for her. Cracked spines, pen marks in the margins and on the end papers, coffee stains on the cover, these were all simply marks of her affection for the book. If she left a book open face down on her bedside table, it just meant she could pick it up more easily and start reading where she left off. Her favourite books were her tattiest because she had read them to death. She had no interest in preserving her books in pristine condition. She wanted them to look as though they'd been read. When these two book lovers saw each other's bookshelves, they recoiled in dismay. How can you possibly treat your books like that? asked the courtly lover, surveying the cracked and creased spines of her carnal counterpart's books. Don't you have any respect for them? The carnal lover, facing the bookcase of her courtly opposite number, said, 
Have you actually read any of these books? It certainly doesn't look like it. And so they would part company, each shaking her head at the other's misguided approach to books. The more I looked at books for traces of how they'd been read, the more evidence I found of their past adventures with other owners and readers. I started to love old books for their accumulated signs of use as much as I loved new books for their pristine sense of potential. I also realised that reading isn't the only thing we do with books, or the only thing that leaves traces on them. The travel writer and Second World War hero Patrick Lee Fermor, for example, liked to paste envelopes into the back covers of his books, which he would then fill up with letters from friends, notes, newspaper clippings and other relevant scraps. He described his habit in a 1982 letter like this. My system is to cut the flap off an envelope and then stick it with Yoohoo glue inside the back board of the books with the now unflapped opening facing upwards but inwards so the contents can't fall out. It makes the book much more interesting later on, is great fun to do and fills one with a feeling of achievement and it is hard to imagine a more insidious and time-wasting excuse for postponing what you really ought to be doing. Start today. In this way, Lee Fermor added interest and value to his books, returning to the same volumes and adding more snippets to their envelopes over a number of years, he developed long-term relationships with his books and made them into a swelling archive of scraps and slips. Reading his books was only the beginning. And he wasn't the only one to turn his books into a kind of filing system or to use them as a set of safety deposit boxes. Giuseppe Tomazzi di Lampedusa, the aristocratic Sicilian author of The Leopard from 1958, wrote a letter to his adopted son in which he identified the real-life people on whom he'd based characters in the novel. This was in the spring of 1957 when the novel was still unpublished and he was about to leave for Rome to be treated for a tumour on his lung that would kill him a few weeks later. His wife had picked up Lampedusa's own habit of putting important documents into books in their extensive library for safekeeping. She put his letter into a volume of The Voyages of, of Captain Cook and forgot all about it. It remained undisturbed between the pages of the book for 47 years until it was rediscovered in the year 2000. In both these examples, books serve purposes besides reading, even for keen readers. In other cases, reading the book may simply be beside the point. The important thing about the book might be its rarity, or the beauty of its binding, or the quality of its craftsmanship, or the identity of a former owner. The text it contains in these cases is almost irrelevant. Some people give, display, examine, or appreciate books without ever reading them. I once met a rich New Yorker who collected books with four-edge paintings, decorations along the front edges of the pages visible only when the book is closed. She didn't even open her expensive books, let alone read them. She was quite happy to spend huge sums of money on books written in languages she couldn't understand or on subjects she had no interest in. For her, the text on the pages was neither here nor there. The object of the book was everything. I soon realised that, if I wanted to understand the secret life of books as things, I needed to pay attention to how books appeared in public, as well as to how they were used in private. Books aren't just personal possessions. They're also focal points for a number of social rituals. Holy books are the most obvious example. In public worship, the veneration due to the scripture often overflows onto the object that contains it. Jewish tradition prescribes that the Torah used in synagogues should be a scroll, not a codex. The scroll is handled with great respect and kept in the ark of the synagogue. In many Christian churches, the Bible is ritually brought in and out of the church and ceremonially read from during the service. Some Muslims believe that they should undertake a ritual cleansing before touching a copy of the Quran. The respect that believers give to the scripture is not limited to the words, but extends to the books as objects, which get invested with a certain dignity of their own. This dignity extends beyond houses of worship and into other contexts. 
In many countries, law courts ask witnesses to swear on the Bible or some other holy book. Despite occasional misgivings by Christians who recall Jesus' words in the Gospel of Matthew, do not take an oath at all. The courts invest the object of the book with a quasi-magical power to make people tell the truth. When a barrister reminds a witness that they are under oath, she is not just warning them that they may be guilty of perjury if they lie, but also invoking the power of certain words spoken over a book to make them tell the truth in the first place. Notice again how little this has to do with actually reading the book. Every day, people who have read little or none of the Bible swear oaths on it in court. In some ways, perhaps, these oaths would be as effective if they involved only a suitably solemn form of words. But the courts continue to bolster the words spoken by bringing out a book. If you open the book and try reading it in this situation, the judge is likely to get rather grumpy. He will observe that you've missed the point. Although the oath wouldn't have quite the same gravitas if sworn on a copy of the latest John Grisham thriller, it's not the text of the book that makes the oath powerful so much as the cultural power ascribed to the book as an object. Barack Obama chose to say the oath of office at both of his inaugurations on a Bible that had belonged to Abraham Lincoln. The power of this book is twofold. The authority of the text it contains is bolstered by the volume's provenance. The US House of Representatives allows newly elected members to choose the book used to swear them in. It doesn't have to be a religious text, but there does have to be a book. You can't be sworn in without one. The power of the book to signify the seriousness of the oath is more important than the contents of the book chosen. Book signings are another important event in the social life of books. And there's a long history of authors inscribing copies of their books for friends. But the modern book signing, where authors sign books for a whole queue of fans, this is a modern invention. Best-selling authors now sign thousands of copies, either at signing events or even in some cases in advance. I heard that uh, Ian Rankin, who, do you know Ian Rankin? He's a, a popular Scottish crime novelist. Uh, and I, I've been told that he signed 30,000 copies of his most recent book. So I think this reveals something interesting about the life of books. In order to grasp what's going on at a book signing, it might help to think about how looking at a painting in a gallery is different from looking at a novel in a library. When you're standing in front of a painting, you're looking at the actual object that the artist worked on. He had the canvas in front of him in the studio. He actually reached out his brush and made the very marks that you see in front of you now. Now, in certain circumstances, we might be happy enough to look at a reproduction, as we have done today, but we don't think it's interchangeable with the painting itself. The painting is the thing. The philosopher of aesthetics, Nelson Goodman, whose ideas I'm borrowing here, calls a painting an autographic art because the work of art is identical with the material objects that the artist worked on, right? The painting really was in the artist's studio and now it really is in front of you, it is a thing. The arts of writing don't exist in the same way. When you pick up a novel in a library or a poem or a play, you're not holding in your hand something that its creator actually touched. Where a painting is made from paint and canvas, a work of literature is made from words which don't have the same material existence in the way that paint does. Our only access to a literary work is through paper and ink, but the work itself isn't made from those things. When you're thinking about a novel, you can draw a line between the object, paper, ink, and the artwork, words, ideas. It doesn't make sense to do that if you're thinking about a painting. Right? A painting isn't anything but the paint whereas a novel is something other than the paper. Writing has a different mode of existence, and Goodman calls this kind of art, which has no physical substrate, allographic. Now, autographic and allographic. When we queue up to get our copy signed at a book signing, I think that on some subconscious level, we've grasped something about the ontology of the book that Goodman's distinction illuminates. The author's signature 
acts as a kind of guarantee that this book is his or her work. Now, it's not that we doubt that the author wrote the words, but when the author signs the title page, the signature, like the signature on a painting, shows that this individual claims this object as their own production. And this is why authors quite often cross out the printed version of their name when they sign. Their action negates the book's existence as a product of industry and commerce and reclaims it as a product of their own artistic effort. So I've come to see book signings as rituals that attempt to convert allographic artworks into autographic ones. In the process, they make buying the book feel less like buying a machine-made product and more like buying a work of art. And this feeling is intensified when the book is not just inscribed by its author, but actually inscribed to you as an individual. Bookshops often ask authors to sign a few extra copies so that they can sell them after the author's gone on to the next stop on his or her tour. But these never seem as satisfying as having the author write your name in a book as well as their own. Having a book inscribed to you, even if it's by an author you've only encountered for a few minutes at a book signing event, offers the comforting sense that this particular book is unlike any other copy of the same title. The book may be a mass-produced commodity, but the inscription allows you to imagine that this particular copy has been destined for you alone. I think you're more likely to read it attentively and keep it carefully as a result. The inscription allows us to turn a blind eye to the many other people besides the author who were involved in the production, marketing and selling of the book, as well as the many other purchasers and readers who will consume it. Just for a moment, it seems less like a product and more like a gift, less like a public statement and more like a personal message. Signing the book is a way of adding value to it as an object. So once I started to pay attention to books as objects in private and in public, I soon began to notice how many other objects we use alongside books. Books sit at the centre of a constellation of other objects which orbit around the book like planets around the sun. Before long I had a whole list of items that are more or less related to books and reading. Bookmarks, book plates, book bags, reading spectacles, reading lights, reading chairs and many more. Many of these things exist only because of books. They've been specially designed and manufactured to be used alongside books. Others are versions of everyday objects modified and repurposed to serve readers. Think of all the things that get used as bookmarks, postcards, business cards, train tickets, boarding passes, takeaway menus. Charity shop workers always have stories of the strange things they've found inside donated books, from antique cigarette cards to £10 notes. Thinking about the book as an object opens the door on a wider culture of bookishness, a material culture of bookishness. When I pick up a book to read, I find I often pick up something else as well, a bookmark, a pencil, a notepad, a cup of tea. The way that I use books is accompanied and supported by the way in which I use other objects. Now there's a long history of this kind of connection between books and other things. For much of the history of the Codex, its manufacturing process left the page edges at the top and the front of the book as folds of paper, what bibliographers call the fore edge and the top edge. In modern books, these edges have, are trimmed with a mechanical guillotine to leave them smooth. But in earlier ages, they might have been trimmed by bookbinders, but per and in indeed they might have been decorated by bookbinders. But purchasers who wanted to read their books in wrappers before they were bound had to cut their way through them with knives, opening the book as they went. Some probably cut one fold at a time and read the pages they'd exposed before cutting the next leaf. A few might have sat down and cut open all the leaves in the book before they started reading, but most people probably cut a few folds, read those pages, and then cut a few more. As a result, we can see whether these readers made it all the way through the book or not. So for these readers, picking up a book often meant picking up a knife too. And there's a great story about this um, that relates to Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin uh, had a problem in his theory of evolution, which was that he couldn't explain through his uh, idea of natural selection how, for example, two 
brown-eyed parents could produce a blue-eyed child. Natural selection didn't seem to explain that. What he needed, as we now know, is the theory of genetics, uh, which would explain how the gene for blue-eyedness can be uh, carried recessively by both brown-eyed parents and then expressed in their offspring. Gregor Mendel was working on this uh, at the time and had published his results in a scientific journal. And when after Darwin died, uh, that journal where Mendel's results that would have solved this problem that Darwin was worried about, that journal was found in Darwin's library. But the pages of Mendel's article were uncut. So we know that Darwin didn't open those pages and read them. So the moral of this story is twofold. The first moral is always read to the end of the book because you never know what might uh, happen. And the second moral is that we can learn things about the history of the use of books by the physical traces that readers of the past have left on them. So most well-off readers, I'm sure, including Darwin, had special paper knives for opening books, which they might also have used for letters and so on. In some cases, any knife that came to hand would do. The 19th century essayist Thomas de Quincey recounts how William Wordsworth came round for tea at de Quincey's house, and while he was there, he picked up a volume of Edmund Burke's writings, uh, and finding the leaves unopened, grabbed a buttery knife from the tea table and proceeded to use that to cut his way into his friend's book. De Quincey claimed not to mind, but he did mention that the knife left its greasy honours behind it upon every page where they were visible to this day. A few years ago, I brought a set of Benjamin Disraeli's novels that had obviously never been read. Although they were over 75 years old, the pages were unopened. I had to cut my way through them with a paper knife. And in the process, I experienced a physical relationship with the book that was rather different from what I was used to and must have been much closer to the experience of readers in earlier centuries. So the other things that we use to uh, facilitate our reading shape the experience of, of the book and of reading the book. When reading the books in bed, however, I did have an unfortunate tendency to leave the knife on top of the sheets when I turned out the light. Ever since, I've associated Disraeli's novels with unpleasant nocturnal surprises. The objects that get drawn into the orbit of the book help to reveal how people use books and how they make them part of their lives. Women readers in the past often interspersed their reading with needlework. Both were socially acceptable activities that you could do sitting down at home. Both required good light, and so they were often done in the same room, even in the same chair. Women who picked up their work basket full of scraps, needles and thread with one hand must often have picked up a book with the other. And sometimes the activities of reading and sewing got stitched together. Scripture reading might supply texts to be embroidered into a sampler. And the work basket might provide tools for reading too. I recently looked at an 18th century volume from the library of a Scottish country house. Tucked between the pages was a pin, probably borrowed for a makeshift bookmark and forgotten. It had almost certainly been there for over two centuries, slowly rusting and leaving greenish stains on the adjacent leaves. In another volume from the same library, the title page had started to fall out and someone had pinned it back into the book as though it were a patch on a pair of trousers. Some of Jane Austen's manuscripts reveal um, sections of the manuscript where she's rewritten on new scraps of paper and then pinned using uh, needlework pins, pinned the new section over the old section. Using books sometimes means not only patching them up, but also pulling them apart. Although modern librarians tend to frown on this kind of thing, scholars in the 16th and 17th centuries often read with scissors or knives in hand, cutting up both manuscript and printed sources into scraps and filing those scraps uh, according to categories in elaborate systems. Readers of all kinds use pens and ink to write in their books. 
And before the invention of the modern pencil and the ballpoint pen, this was a much more involved practice than it is today. And so it's interesting to think about when you see ink inscriptions or marginalia in old books, just what was involved in that, finding the pen, finding the ink, mending the pen, um, mending the nib with a pen knife and so on. And some readers even painted marginal illustrations into their books or commissioned other people to do so. All these examples suggest how using books is nothing like the disembodied communion between a reader's mind and an author's that Proust described. Instead, it's a thoroughly material business involving a variety of tools and objects. Books have their own furniture too. 18th century gentlemen furnishing their libraries needed not only bookcases, but also specially designed library chairs, tables and ladders. Lecterns made books available for reading aloud in public, for example in a lecture theatre like this one, or a church, or a monastery where books were often read aloud during meals. And also in families where scripture reading or family prayers might be routine events. Lecterns also made it possible to read books hands-free while doing something else. With the help of a lectern, you can read and eat at the same time, for example, or consult a cookbook while making a recipe from it. In his 60s, the poet Philip Larkin put a lectern in his bedroom with a Bible on it. He reportedly read the book while shaving, which sounds like a dangerous habit. Whether this mode of reading influenced Larkin's conclusion, expressed in one of his letters, that the Bible was absolute balls, uh, is difficult to say. Some people needed more specialised equipment. The book wheel was an early modern machine that allowed its user to mount several books onto trays on a large wheel. So when the wheel was turned, the trays all stayed upright as they moved round, like the cars on a Ferris wheel. And this allowed Renaissance scholars to consult several books, one after the other, comparing them against each other. As they span the wheel, they were able to toggle between uh, one book and another, like uh, toggling between windows on a computer desktop. Spinning the book wheel allowed readers to examine several texts at once uh, while uh, moving between them with a minimum of fuss. As that analogy with the computer suggests, we have our own versions of these bookish objects today. The noise-cancelling headphones worn by a 21st century worker on a commuter train serve the same purpose as the wing-backed chair sitting in a Victorian parlour. Both create a semi-permeable zone of privacy in the middle of a space that has to be shared with other people. Both provide a kind of screen between the individual and those around them. And both, therefore, can be used uh, to create a space where reading is possible. Like the Victorian with his head in a book, shielded from engaging with the rest of his family by the wing-backed armchair that he sinks deeper into, the modern commuter in her headphones, squinting at a novel on her phone, is making an environment that's inhospitable to reading a little bit more reader-friendly. The headphones clamped over her ears allow her to carve out time and space for reading in a busy, overstimulating environment. And that, of course, uh, reminds us that the commuter sitting with her headphones reminds us of the enormous growth in audiobooks in the last few years, um, offering us a different modality of reading. One very fascinating question that I hope we'll have a chance to talk about uh, later on in one of the other classes is uh, how the experience of listening to an audiobook differs from the experience of encountering a physical book. I had a student um, a few years ago who wrote on her exam paper uh, that she didn't know how to spell the name of one of the characters in the book she was discussing because she'd only listened to the book as an audiobook and not read it. And my first reaction to this was to say, how dare this student write an exam answer on a book she hadn't read, but only listened to? And then I thought again, and I thought about the history of audiobooks and the way in which they allow people, often who can't access books in other uh, modes, to access uh, books. And I looked again at the quality of the student's answer, and really, even though she didn't know how to spell the name of this character, it was very good, so I gave it a high mark. 
Um, and that was an important moment for thinking about how we encounter books in different ways. But one thing that I'm also interested in is how the experience of audiobooks or ebooks changes what we can do with books. I'm concerned with all the things that we do with books besides simply reading them. Uh, and so when we change the physical form of the book, all of those things change as well. It's much harder to give and receive uh, ebooks and audiobooks. It's much harder to make them the objects of social rituals. It's much harder to give them at significant life moments. You can annotate them, but those annotations are very unlikely to be inherited by future generations and studied. And so these changes, I think, are really um, uh, interesting for us to think about. I started, or nearly started, with my 40 copy of Middlemarch. It might not have let me finish George Eliot's novel that day, but it did get me thinking about books in a new way. They started to come into focus for me, as I hope they're now starting to come into focus for you, as objects in their own right, not just as containers of words. And once I started to pay attention to books as things, I realized that you couldn't talk about the book as an object without also talking about the different things that people did with books. Reading was one of those things, of course, and people's readings left their own traces on books. But reading was only one of the things that people did with books and not always the most important. Reading is often thought of as something done in private, but books also had a public life and they demanded to be understood in relation to the wider world. And people used books alongside other objects so they couldn't be understood in isolation from the rest of the material culture of bookishness. I had been taught to ignore the book itself in favour of the text it contained. But once I stopped looking through books and started looking at books, the secret life of books was revealed to me. Thanks very much. I guess I'm going to sit down, but I'm very happy to take questions if people have questions to ask. Thank you, Professor Moll, for your lecture, which has been really interesting. I've learned a lot with your words. And I have a couple of questions that have to do with you and your way you treat the books. When you were talking about um, I don't remember who was the one that inserted envelopes in the books. <laughs> I think I understood that this person uh, used to uh, put all kinds of different papers and receipts and things inside the envelope so that the book finally uh, would reveal the reader something different. Do you also do that with your books? Do you have books with envelopes? Uh, no, I don't. Um, but it's interesting. I think there were, there were two ways of using books there that I wanted to identify. One was um, to make the book an archive of notes and perhaps newspaper cuttings that related to that book or that author um, so that you were enhancing that book and could go back to it uh, and, and develop a kind of relationship with that book over time. And the other way, and that was I, the way I used Patrick Lee Fermor as an example of that. The other way was to use your books as a kind of set of safety deposit boxes so that you could put something in that didn't necessarily relate to the book, um, but that the book was a sort of safe place of keeping. Keep and, th and that reflects the durability of books and the way in which we live with them over long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you can, use them, you can only use them like that because uh, they become this constant presence in the lives of their owners. Um, so I think that's really interesting. But I, do, I don't do this systematically, but I do um, sometimes leave uh, a bookmark in a book even after I've finished it. And quite often, I'm sure many of you do the same thing, mm. um, I use a train ticket as yeah. a bookmark or a boarding pass in the or days anything. when we used to have paper boarding passes. Um, uh, or something like that. And so then years later, you might pull the book off the shelf and open it and see, uh, you know, be reminded of the occasion when you read it, uh, if you don't remember that already, that is. 
And that, that's one thing that interests me about um, the difference between paper books and e-books yeah. is the ways in which we leave our mark on the paper book in ways that won't happen in the same way with the e-book, I think. Um, and therefore, the I think the ways in which e-books or the social life of e-books is different from the social life of paper books because they don't <coughs> connect to our to other objects, to our memories, to Anything. our you know our sense of ourselves in quite the same way. Thank you. The, uh, uh, regarding e-books, uh, you suggested me something. I don't like e-books. I, I have one, but I personally don't like it very much because see, because. Um, I never know, I forget, it's incredible, but I forget the title of the book because I don't have the cover with me. So when I return to my book and I press, you know, you, are, you left the book in page 155 and then you continue. But sometimes when I try to remember, what am I reading? I cannot <laughs> remember. So it's something very curious, but it happens. It happens to me. And I'm not very lazy with the memory, no, but I forget the titles of the book. So that is one of the disadvantages I find with these books. Another one, of course, is that we all love books, you know, and we all love the covers and illustrations and everything, and e-books do not have these, but at least the ones I, I use, no? And something else that you mentioned in your lecture, which I found interesting, when you were talking about uh, women working and reading at the same time, and you mentioned when they were doing sewing. Um, I'm trying to think how can you uh, sew something and turn the pages. No, I think it's a bit difficult to do that. Can you explain yes, this to me? Yes, I don't. Um, so I didn't want to suggest that women were sewing and reading at the same time, okay. but rather they were doing it by turns okay. because these were both acceptable activities for women to take part in. They both happened in the home, typically in the same spaces. Um, and there is you know, some evidence, such as the, the use of pins as yes. uh, bookmarks or for repairs on books, that these two activities did sort of overlap with one another. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other thing that goes into that is reading aloud, which of is course. something that we do that much less these yeah. days, but historically was very prevalent indeed. Yeah. Um, and uh, in all sorts of situations, but certainly in families, uh, and not only for children uh, or for people who couldn't read, but among groups of literate adults yeah, as well. Someone was reading for the rest. Yeah, yeah. so that, that happens quite often. And that's you know one thing that that means is that reading can be combined with mm -hmm. other kinds of um, physical work. Yeah, and then the third aspect, and I will finish because I want the rest of the people to talk to also. Um, when you mentioned the audiobooks, hmm, uh, I've been working very closely with blind people. So it's mm. really very interesting because I've never worked, I've been reading e-books, but I've, I haven't never used audiobooks, so I don't have that experience that your students say that I cannot, re I cannot remember how to write this because I just heard it. It's not my case. But uh, in fact, when audiobooks started, they were really important for a big number of population that could not read the books, no? So I think this could also be mentioned. It's a suggestion. That's, that's absolutely right. And um, Matthew Rubri has written a terrific history of the talking book. Mm -hmm. um, and he shows us how audiobooks started off as being primarily for blind and visually impaired users. Yeah. Um, and indeed, part of the way that audiobooks got <coughs> um, took off was because government sponsored uh, them as a service to disabled people and particularly to disabled veterans. Yeah. Um, and uh, but then at some point in the 1970s, audiobooks shifted from being primarily for the blind to being books for the busy. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the rise the of lazy. portable, well, no, the well, yes, maybe for the lazy. But um, the books on tape uh, is a Californian company originally, which marketed its audiobooks specifically to people doing long commutes. Yeah and you would listen to them while you were on a long uh, driving commute. And so the combination of the, the long sort of increasing, um, increasing numbers of people doing really long commutes by car with the arrival of portable cassette players yeah. kind of made it possible for these to take off. And now one of the things that's a big selling point of audiobooks for lots of people is that you can listen to them while you're doing other things, yeah. you know, while you're doing chores, while you're working out, while you're... But you know. if you're listening to a book and you're doing other things, 
don't you think that there's something that you're not doing very well? You're not paying enough attention to the book while you're cooking or you're shaping, as you explained before, or something well, like that? Well, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's uh, books... You should be concentrated. Encountering books... Well... No? <laughs> perhaps, but let's not... Let's not be too judgmental about it, because remember that books have always had to find, you know, reading has always had to be structured around other activities that people have, have had to do. Um, and so finding time for reading is, uh, you know, is a key kind of thing. And that's different formats of the book, including books that you can carry with you easily, you know, so that you can read in the, the interstices of other uh, activities are a way of facilitating that. Yeah. Um, but it's also really interesting to think about how our habits of reading are fostered in relation to the particular physical forms of the book that we encounter, um, and so how they might be fostered differently. So I'm like you. I find it harder to read on an e-reader. I find that it tends to the reading tends to be less memorable. Mm. And there's some evidence to back this up, that uh, groups of um, readers, when asked to read the same text in scientific conditions, where one group is asked to read on paper and another is asked to read on the screen, those who read on paper tend to do better in tests about comprehension and um, uh, how, uh, how well they remember. Yeah than those who read on the screen. Forget the but title. <laughs> is, this, is this a factor of, is this about the screen and the page, or is it about the readers and the kind of training that they've had? Because we're still talking about, you know, these kinds of scientific studies are mostly done with undergraduates. Um, so we're still talking about people who have mostly grown up learning to read on the page, and mostly in educational settings, still, you know, uh, 18, 19, 20-year-old uh, <coughs> people have still grown up mostly with paper in educational settings and are making the switch later on. When we see a generation who have had access to reading on the screen from before they could read, will we see different kinds of reading abilities and different kinds of emotional investments as well? Right? And I'm sure that you know plenty of people who are emotionally invested in their smartphone uh, in a way that they're not invested in any books, right? yeah. in a way that in an earlier generation that uh, emotional attachment might have been towards a book. So will we, you know, I, I can't imagine as a writer feeling the same kind of satisfaction looking at a list of PDFs on a computer as I can looking at a small shelf of books. Um, but maybe in the future writers will we, we won't be here. find that. I don't know. So <laughs> it's, yeah, I think these, you know, are all of the ways in which we relate to books that I've been talking about are learned. Right, they're culturally constructed. Nobody's born reading, nobody's born loving books. So they're, they're culturally <coughs> constructed in specific circumstances. So if those circumstances change, they could be constructed differently in the future. Um, so I think we have to be careful about being too kind of technologically determinist about this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, the rest of the people. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Professor Mole, for a most interesting presentation. Um, I, I found it fascinating the way that you've developed um, and in a sense shared your, your experience as a book lover with us over, um, over, over this last, last hour. Um, <coughs> to follow up the last issue, one of the frightening things that happens nowadays, particularly with, with, um, with computers, is that you're you, you're, you're conscious that there are many things that you have to learn, learn, um, uh, act on, and then forget. And in a sense, we are in a, in a culture in which forgetting is almost as important as learning, or at least forgetting some things is almost important as learning. So, uh, however, um, I... I to introduce myself, I, I, I'm a, I, 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 uh, 
I try to 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 uh, teach philosophy, so I'm a, I'm <coughs> I'm one of our colleagues in the Complutense, and what I what I would point to you, or what I would suggest to you, is that um, your distinction between looking through a a, a a material object, which is a book, to the text, or looking at the material object is a, a very important distinction. But uh, it's the, it, it, to a certain degree, there are s s situations in which it doesn't, ha it doesn't hold. For instance, as a book reader, I fashion the book to my interest as a reader. I underline, I annotate. So in a sense, uh, when I've read a book, I can go back to it and I can use it m in a much more useful sense because it's an object and I've, to a certain extent, fashioned it. Um, so that on, that on one side. And then on the other, the other point I would make is that though not as um, wide as the presentation you've done of material objects and their, and their uh, situation in a society, a text itself is always something very relative to, to the reader. So you can you can say that 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 you can, for instance, uh, uh, understand a text. You will always gain to understand a text from a perspective which may not be the perspective of someone else. So 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 in that sense, the complexity of material objects is reproduced on a symbolic level. Yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I. All of those points um, are interesting, and I want to engage with them. Firstly, the question of um, reading on the screen versus reading on the page. And um, I'm very encouraged to hear you say that now is a time when we must learn to forget things, because I, I think that's something I'm already quite good at. Um, the, but it may be that the crucial difference is um, is less to do with reading on the page versus reading on the screen than it is to do with um, the conditions of distraction in which we now read. Um, and so uh, the, you know, one of the things that's important about the book is that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the object and the content. Um, one book only contains one text and, and always will. Um, whereas that's not true about uh, an e-reader, and increasingly now, uh, reading on the screen is done not on dedicated e-readers, but on multifunction devices like tablets and increasingly phones. Um, so then, if you're reading on a device that, at any given moment, allows you to jump out of your book and go shopping, check your emails, go on social media, then you have a different experience. And it may be that that's actually uh, even more important than the uh, the different kind of mode of delivery. In terms of the distinction between looking at a text, looking looking at the book, and looking through the book, um, you're right. I think that we um, we learn early on to treat books as strings of signs to be deciphered. Um, but I'm not suggesting that the two can be entirely divorced from each other because, in fact, I think our, our phenomenological experience of the book is that we are always paying attention to the material form even when we don't understand that we're doing that. Um, and there's in uh, a class that I'm going to give tomorrow, I want to highlight a comment made by the literary critic Jerome McGann who said, every literary text works in a double helix of perceptual codes, the linguistic codes and the bibliographic codes. And I really like that idea that you know, the way when we encounter a text from the past, we're deciphering the words, but we're also paying attention to the messages that the material object sends as well. And so I think um, you, uh, as you're well aware, there's a whole debate about the extent to which the meaning of a text is constructed in the act of reading um, and how that happens and who is responsible for that construction. 
Um, and what I think the history of the book can add to that is to say that, well, if, if that's true, that the meaning of a text is constructed, or at least partially constructed in the act of reading, that act of reading always takes place in relation to a material object. And so there's a materiality, a material dimension to that as well. So thank you very much. Uh, hello, Professor Mo. Uh, thank you for your um, your class. It's been very interesting. Um, my question is, um, I think one of the, m the most interesting thing that we can do is uh, to build our own library. And um, I think over time, you your preferences for books change, and they tell a lot about you and who you are. So I was wondering if you're familiar um, with uh, uh, um, research that could have been done in um, in the libraries of maybe authors or intellectuals that uh, would tell a story of their development. Um, in like for instance, I'm 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 doing a research in female writers, and um, I am very interested about how they change over time, how their interests change over time, and I was wondering if you could see some of that through their libraries. Yeah, that's a really terrific question. Um, the, I mean, the obvious problem is where, well, perhaps there are two obvious problems. The first one is, do we have the libraries? Um, how do we know? Um, sometimes, you know, there are cases where an individual's library will still be intact, where it, it, it will be, um, and you'll be able to visit it. Um, I did some interesting work was interesting to me, um, on uh, the library of a Victorian preacher called Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And I was interested in how Spurgeon had used Byron in his preaching. Um, and he quotes Byron quite often and sometimes in rather contradictory ways. So I thought, where is he getting this from? And it just so happens that Spurgeon's library is still intact in a, a college in America. Um, and so I was able to go and visit it and look at the books by Byron that Spurgeon owned and um, the uh, ways he'd marked those books. But what turned out to be even more important was um, not, the, um, not the complete editions of Byron, but all the anthologies and books of quotations and things like that. Um, and a lot of the bits of Byron that Spurgeon quoted turned out to be in those anthologies. So they were clearly kind of mediating Byron to him. So that was an, uh, an interesting case study of that process. So the first problem is, can you get to the library at all? Sometimes it may be physically extant. Sometimes the auction, there may be an auction catalog if the library was sold at auction that lists the books in the library. But then you have the second problem, which is if you're interested in development over time, you have to know when the books were acquired in the first place. Um, and some people write dates in their books, um, which may be dates of acquisition or may be something else. Um, and so if you have those ex that, then you can tell something about how their tastes are changing over time. Um, but many don't. Uh, and so you, would ha you have to find a, a case study that's going to work well for that. But it's a really interesting idea. And I, I love the idea that um, even when we've finished reading books, you know, what the, the whole question of why, why we keep books, um, right? even when we finish reading them, in some sense we think we haven't finished with them. Um, and we want to go back to them, or, or perhaps we want to display them. And displaying books is a way of displaying a certain version of yourself. So, um, yeah, that, that whole area, I think, is a really interesting one. No sé si hay alguna pregunta más para el profesor Moul. Si no hay ninguna pregunta más para el profesor Moul, pues ya despedimos esta conferencia informando de lo que vamos a hacer los próximos días. Eh, estáis inscritos unas 60 personas, hoy es evidente que no estáis los 60, pero las dos clases de mañana, mañana y tarde, van a ser también en aquí en la sala de, de conferencias. La conferencia de hoy ha sido grabada gracias al servicio de imagen corporativa de la Universidad Complutense y en breves días la tendréis disponible en el canal YouTube de la UCM. 
Y ya por último, pues como queremos que esto sea un, un seminario donde la comunicación entre el profesor y los alumnos sea lo más eh, fructífera posible, pues deciros que en febrero y en abril eh, haremos unas visitas, una en febrero probablemente a la Biblioteca de Palacio Real, esta, este seminario está patrocinado por la Fundación Hispano-Británica dentro de una cátedra complutense hispano-británica que se llama Reina Victoria Eugenia. Claro, los libros de la Reina Victoria Eugenia están en la Biblioteca del Palacio Real de Madrid. Iremos con el profesor Moul y después en abril haremos otra visita eh, a la eh, Real Biblioteca del Escorial para concluir el, el seminario. Os iremos informando por correo electrónico porque naturalmente para una visita o para la otra necesitamos saber cuántos de vosotros os vais a apuntar a esas dos visitas culturales. Y bueno, con esto y dando las gracias al profesor Moul por su intervención y su excelente conferencia, pues nos despedimos hasta mañana donde seguiremos aprendiendo mucho sobre la historia del libro. Un aplauso.